Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Scott, and I am your instructor for this wonderful Android class. Um, I'm normally not going to have the video on me uh, because I tend to be looking all over the place and it's distracting, so I will remove that shortly. But I just wanted to say hi. Hi. Uh, I hope everybody is in the right class. Uh, this is the Android development class, 605.686, and we will be doing Android development. Yay. Um, so let me go ahead and dive into the slides here. Um, what we're talking about to start with is going to be course logistics. So I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly so that we have time for other stuff in the class. Um, but uh, just a little bit about who I am. I've been a developer since 1989. And uh, during part of that, there were four years where I was a corporate trainer. I was flying all over the place teaching Java. Um, I've been teaching at Hopkins since 2002. I did my master's here back in the 90s. I think I got my master's in 94 or something like that. Um, and there was an instructor that I got to be really good friends with. And he uh, was assigned to teach an XML class, but he had to actually go work out of town. So he gave me a call and said, hey, do you want me to put your name in? And I'm like, sure. So I got my foot in the door and got to teach here. So I've been teaching here for over 20 years now. And um, my big classes that I've been teaching, the Android class was one that I've, I've taught many, many times, as well as design patterns. Um, I gave up on the design pattern one when we started to move that to online because there was another instructor who was the, the primary instructor and somebody wants to be admitted. There we go. Uh, there was another instructor that was the primary instructor and we had very different styles of teaching the class. So trying to, to coordinate those for an online version didn't really seem like it was going to work out all that well. So I just bowed out. Um, I miss it though. I really enjoyed teaching design patterns. I am currently employed at Google as an Android developer relations engineer. Um, the job description on that basically is writing articles and samples and videos and speaking at conferences, getting input from people and taking it back to the engineers, things like that. Um, it's kind of morphed from that quite a bit, so I'm really not doing much of that. Um, there is one page on developer.android.com that's all me, and I'll point that out at some point. It's how to set up uh, JDKs in your build. Woo! Uh, and uh, I, I feel like I'm having some impact with that. It's wonderful. Um, so here's some other pictures of me. Um, this is me at the uh, uh, Sandy Spring Adventure Park. They have like 20 zip line course or 20 ropes courses most of them have a few zip lines in each of them um really fun place that's a long time ago that's probably 15 years ago now wow uh, this is me swing dancing with my dad's ex-girlfriend uh at a wedding um, i love the swing dance it's a lot of fun uh this is me on a roller coaster uh, i'm a big roller coaster nut uh this the dominator down at king's dominion they have the camera in a spot that it's like you hit this just wind blast. And so everybody's kind of like, oh my God. So you get a lot of great pictures out of that one. Um, and then this was when I was working at Cedar Point as Brother Berenstain Bear. They, they, you know, I, I used to be Chuck E. Cheese when I was in high school. And so then I got a, a costume job at uh, Cedar Point. That's when I really learned I loved roller coasters because Cedar Point has the best roller coasters in the world. Um, so a couple other little things. I've worked for some famous people. Um, Tom McCabe might be somebody who you've heard of. If you've heard of cyclomatic complexity, that's something that he invited, invented. Um, he is a pure mathematician. Um, he's not really a computer science guy. And so he, he tended to think that linear algebra completely explained everything inside programming, but he didn't like to take into account data flow. So the stuff that he's doing with cyclomatic complexity is good for the structure, the, the control structure. But, you know, when I was with him, I used to get into some nice headbutting with him about, you know, hey, we should really take a look at data flow as well and take that into account when we're explaining a program and when we're designing test cases. Um, I also worked for Frank Dreamer and Tom Pinello. If anybody here has taken a compiler course or if you've heard of Lex and Yak, uh, th they invented something called LALR parsing, which is a bottom-up parsing technique. Basically, it finds groups of tokens inside of a file and kind of gradually builds up a structure to describe the program so that you can uh, work with a compiler. Um, Terence Parr, on the other hand, is a, a person who really likes LL parsing, which is top-down parsing. So if you've ever heard of a recursive descent parser, um, he wrote a tool called Antler. Uh, it was originally called PCCTS, and I worked with him for a while. Uh, I wrote a debugger for Antler, Antler 2, I believe, 
And uh, then he was the one who ran the training company that I was, I was working for. Um, I was also on the ANSI C++ 98 uh, committee. Uh, that was when I worked with uh, Frank Dreamer and Tom Pinello. They sent me as the delegate for MetaWare. Uh, I only was in there two meetings, so don't blame me for C++. Um, it is a mess. That that language is crazy. Um, but it was really cool to meet people like Strewstrip and some some other people who were like bigwigs in other companies. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, but design by committee is a huge mess. It's just a really ineffective way to do anything. Um, I also wrote a book back in 2001 called Effective Visual Age for Java. Uh, at that point, I was pretty much IBM's visual age evangelist. And so, you know, I was doing kind of what my current job's supposed to be, you know, going and speaking at conferences, writing articles, writing a book. Um, if videos were really a big thing back then, I would have been doing videos. But around that time, uh, the late 90s, you know, YouTube wasn't, God, it's weird to think of that. YouTube wasn't a thing. Wow. Um, so uh, that's been fantastic. Um, I'm going to put the put my little participants window up and my chat window, just in case anybody has any little comments. There, that's good. Okay, um, so that's kind of my about me section there. Um, what I'd like to have everybody here do is take a look at SIS and make sure that your contact information is correct. So, you know, check your email, check your phone number. Uh, if I have to cancel a class, um, you know, typically each term there might be a time when I get sick. Usually it's I lose my voice and then it's kind of hard to do this. Um, but uh, if I need to contact you, I will send an email. I will, uh, if, if I don't hear responses, I will uh, give you a call just to make sure you know that the class is canceled uh, and what the alternative plans are. Um, I do use this for all the communication and this is all also where any announcements for the class go to. Um, the course sites we're gonna be dealing with this term. This is a virtual live session. Um, I do have listed here AndroidByExample.com, which is the online course materials for uh, when we do the class in the spring and the, and the fall. Um, for the summer, it, we always do it face-to-face uh, -face or you know virtual live like this. Um, main class site, canvas.jhu.edu. Hopefully you're all really familiar with that. Um, the recordings, every, every class session I will record it. And I will post it on this Git, uh, post a link to it on the GitLab repository. Um, I post the videos in YouTube. And the reason I use YouTube for that is because it does a really good job of transcribing. Um, really good is relative, but it's, you know, what you can do is you can use the trans transcript to search to if you want to try to find things during the class sessions. And I recommend you do that. Um, it typically takes a couple hours for the video to actually get processed at YouTube. Um, but the next day when you look at it, or, you know, if you look at it a few hours after the class is done, um, you should be able to search the videos. Um, Android by example, like I mentioned, this is the online version of the course website. There's a few things I'll direct you to there. And if for some reason I can't teach a class, I'll have you go there to take a look at the materials for whatever week that is. Um, some of the content on there is text. Some of the content is videos. Uh, the text content tends to be the newer content that's on there, except for the, co the Kotlin primer I kept as a video when I redid it uh, last year. Um, the sample code for the online sessions, I also just have a link here. Um, this link, all these links actually are on the Canvas site on the main home page. You'll see them there. Real brief uh, discussion of grading. There's nine programming assignments. Most of these are weekly. There are a couple that are a little bit longer, and those are two-week assignments. Uh, the way I set these up is I use GPA scoring on these. Uh, when I grade them, I will put just comments in and then give a grade. I won't be saying two points off here, five points off here, or whatever, um, other than the uh, uh, if you're late on assignments, then I'll say you know what the score would have been if you hadn't been late. Um, this came because uh, I used to have a rubric, but people always tried to game it, and it never made a difference. They're always like, that shouldn't be worth one point. That shouldn't be worth it. So I tend to kind of bucket a bunch of things together. So if they're like fairly minor things, they all fall into the A minus bucket. And so pretty much no matter how many of those you get, it's gonna just put you at A minus. Um, then other things can take you to other grades and I'll get to in a little bit here. Um, so uh, basically I, I look at this and I do what I call holistic grading. I look at it as a whole, write some comments and then say, okay, that deserves a B. And then I convert that into a three 
put it into uh, the grade book, and then you're in good shape. Um, there is no A plus in this class that caused some grief because I used to try to reserve it for you know exemplary implementations, not extra work, but exemplary stuff. And so most of the time, a 3.7 was the normal maximum grade. And people thought of that as, oh, I'm losing 0.3 points. And so I decided, okay, I'm not going to do the A plus anymore. Um, now, each day late, if it's a four-point assignment, it's a one-point off. If it's an eight-point assignment, two points off. It's one full letter grade off there. The final grades will not have plus or minus associated with them. That ended up causing confusion when I tried that several years back. Um, you know, People's work would tell them, how do I deal with this plus or minus? Because work generally said, if you get an A, you get full reimbursement. A B, you get I don't know, 50% reimbursement, a C, no reimbursement. Uh, depends on the company, obviously. Um, so that was confusing there. It was also confusing when people went into doctorate programs after this. Sometimes the doctorate programs didn't know what to do with the pluses and minus. So no plus minus, no curve. You get what you get. Um, I really don't like curves. I've always hated that concept where, you know, because back in school, I was the curve wrecker. You know, I was I was like ace and everything, and people hated me for it because, you know, the teachers would apply the bell curve, and it would just everybody's grades would shift down. It's like that's not fair to anybody. Okay, so some general grade guidelines. Keep in mind these are general concepts. This doesn't mean if you did X, you will get that letter grade, or if you got that letter grade, it means you did these things. So there's several things that can put you in these buckets, but kind of as a general guideline, if everything is on time and working and it's a good design, you're gonna get an A. If it's not quite working or you really did something wrong in the design, and it's really important in this class, do things the way I tell you to in the class. Don't look online and find an alternative way to approach a problem. Uh, I'm trying to teach you some best practices in here, and I want you to follow those best practices. There is a lot of information out there, which you know some of it's good, some of it's bad, some of it's outdated. And I don't want you to go and just say, oh, I'm going to go find something that works and try to take that approach. Follow the approaches that I do in this class. Um, with a C, it's usually yeah, people end up with Cs if they start the day before the assignments do. Uh, you know, or a couple days before it's due. Um, I don't take any pity on people when you start that late. I really would like everybody to, when the assignment's assigned, at very least read it right away. Just get a concept of what you're going to need to do. And if you can, within a couple days after the assignment is, is uh, available, really give it a try. Because if you don't, it's really easy to get behind in this class. Um, this can be a lot of work. And uh, you know, it's there's a lot of new concepts. So take a look early. Take advantage of office hours. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but yeah, in general, you see uh, a C will be like if it doesn't compile, if there's big chunks of function missing, things like that. F, I try to reserve it for issues like plagiarism you know, or other honor code type violations. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, or if, you know, really all you did was copy a sample and change a couple names and that was it. Uh, sometimes people will do that as a last minute. And they, you know, they, they panic and they want to submit something. But, you know, if all it is is, you know, a, a, basically you're just turning in the sample code with no, none of your own changes, um, it's probably going to end you up with a, with a C or an F. Um, or if you just don't turn it in, it's an F. Okay, um, for academic integrity, key point here is all the work must be your own. You do not turn in something that is misrepresenting the work as your own. So don't find a solution online and then just submit it. And you know, I'm really good at catching this, and it it causes me you know a whole lot of heartache to see people, you know, you know, cheating things like that. One of the most common problems that I see is people working together, and I will catch it. I'm really good at catching this. I caught two people last term and uh, four people the term before. Uh, where what they'll do is, you know, it sometimes, you know, somebody will give the code to somebody else and then they'll make some changes trying to make it obvious. It doesn't work. Uh, don't try it. Just do your own work. It's It's really, you know, there's a lot of work in this class, but it's really, I don't think, that hard. It's you know, a lot of new concepts. If you need help, ask me for help. Okay. Um, what you can do is if you want to discuss the concepts in the class, like let's say you have some friends in the class, feel free to discuss the concepts and whatever I've talked about in the class. But when it comes down to talking about the assignment, 
don't talk about implementation details. Don't talk about how would you do this, how would you do that. You can talk about what the assignment says. You know, if, if somebody is you know looking at uh, one of the points in the assignment and you're not quite sure what it means, feel free to ask somebody. You know, ask in the forums. Ask you know, send an email to me uh, for clarification. That's great, but don't get into the details of um, you know, how you actually would implement things. Okay, so let's see. Um, so generally, if you do break the, the academic integrity, um, the first time is a zero on the assignment. If it happens more than once or if you've done it in previous classes, that will end up uh, costing you the whole class um, at a minimum. Um, I have had uh, some people who I had some really severe academic integrity problems. Um, one person ended up uh, getting suspended for two terms and uh, wasn't able to retake this class. Um, so there's, you know, depending on the severity of things, that was a super severe case. Um, just don't do it. Uh, it. It's, you know, do your own work, do well in the class, ask questions when you need to. Now, this also doesn't account for just final submissions. Um, some, you know, if you're having trouble while you're developing things, you know, you can send that to me and usually to send it to me, you just submit it and let me know, hey, I'm having a problem. Can you take a peek? Um, even if you're before the final submission, whatever you give to me, you're presenting that as your work. So if it's, you know, there was one student who sent me something, you know, halfway through the assignment when it was being worked on. And, it, you know, I figured out that it, they'd copied it from online. And his uh, counter to that was, well, you know, I haven't really submitted it yet. And it's like, no, you're misrepresenting this work. You're saying that this is what you worked on and you're asking questions about it. So, you know, just don't do it. Do your own work and you'll be in great shape. Now, code attribution, if you do find little bits online that you want to reuse, um, and you know, a lot of times you might go to Stack Overflow or something and find a little snippet, um, that's okay as long as you attribute it. And really all I want for attribution is a little comment, kind of like at the bottom, say where you got it from and say what license it is. It's really important that you say what license it is. You know, there's going to be stuff you might find in articles. If the article doesn't say this is licensed as a certain license, you can't use it. Um, so I'll talk about Stack Overflow in a minute. But, you know, if you see an article that's that says, you know, all the code here is Apache 2, or if it links to a repository and the repository says it's Apache 2, then you'd have a comment that looks something like this. Um, you cannot use a viral license, so anything like GPL or CC by SA, which is Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike, you can't use those um, because the license says if you do this, you have to license your code using the same license. Um, so just you know, you can put a little attribution at the point of use. If it's source code for that I've given you as a sample, you know, and a lot of these things are going to be really close to samples that I've done in the class. Um, just put a comment at the top saying, you know, based on the, the course content code, something like that. Um, now, in this course, using Stack Overflow is okay, and I'll be okay license-wise. But in real life, be really careful of Stack Overflow because it's everything on there is licensed CC by SA. And you know, that means that if you use the code, if you copy it from Stack Overflow, you must license your code CC by SA. Unless there is a uh, an explicit license listed on the code, which would be an additional license. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, you might see is, uh, what is it, SS, SSPF? Let me take a look at something here real quick. Um, there. So let me go to Stack Overflow and see. Um, see if I can find one that I had. Yeah, here we go. SPDX, that's it. So if you see a little header kind of like this, this is what when you know we're from Google, if we answer something on Stack Overflow, we put this little comment in. And what it means is that the code is copyrighted Google, but we're granting the Apache 2 license on it for your use. Um, so if you see that, it's perfectly fine to copy it and, and paste it into your code and you're good because you just have to adhere to Apache 2. Um, but if you don't see that, it's CC by SA. Be really careful about that. Okay, so we'll come back over here. Um, generally, if, if it doesn't have that, your best approach is to use a clean room approach. Read the article, understand it, 
re read the answer, understand it, and then close that browser window and implement it. And then you'll be okay. Okay, so for your assignments, all of the assignments in this class will be written in Kotlin. Kotlin is the primary language that Google has put forth for Android. And all of the new libraries are Kotlin first, meaning that they've been developed for use with Kotlin. And some of them won't even work with Java. Like if you're using Jetpack Compose, which is our user interface toolkit we're going to be working, you won't be able to use that. Um, uh, uh, you won't be able to use that in Java at all. Um, I'm assuming that you are very comfortable with Java. And uh, I did have uh, some information of that in the syllabus. Um, so please double check the syllabus and make sure that you know what's listed there you feel comfortable with. You know, basically how the language works. And you know, you don't need to get up into you know advanced Java 8 features, um, but pretty much anything up through Java 7 features is you know what I'm assuming you know. Java 8 adds lambdas and things like that. Um, we're going to be using lambdas in Kotlin quite a bit, but I'll be talking through it, so you don't have to really worry about that. Um, basically, you're going to kind of be learning Kotlin by osmosis here. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll see it in examples. If you have questions, please ask. I will be explaining things along the way, and I'll be pointing you at a Kotlin primer uh, to watch later on. Um, all of your assignments must be built using the Gradle build system inside Android Studio, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, you can turn your assignments in any number of times, and but I will only grade the last one. Please don't ask me to give you the best grade out of whatever your, your submissions are. Um, I do ask that you adhere to some coding conventions because I like to read your code and understand it. Um, it's especially important if you are uh, sending me something beforehand and asking me to help you out. Um, if I can't read your code, it's going to make it really hard for me to get you something back in time to, to help with um, and make it really hard for the grading. Um, so things that I ask. Leading indentation. Use all spaces or use all tabs, but don't use both. I'm okay with either one of those because they'll show up fine in my, my editor when I take a look at your code. Um, for any types that you have, you know, whether it's a class or an interface or enumeration or a composable function, you're going to use upper camel case. And this is going to feel weird for functions. The composable functions, the convention is upper camel, just like it's a, uh, um, a, a class. Uh, that's intentional because we're trying to treat these composable functions as definitions or declarations. So it, it's really, you know, it, it feels weird at first, but you get used to it. Um, so any of those upper camel case, that means all of your words squished together, each word starts in uppercase, the rest of the letters in the word are lowercase. For any type of variables or non-composable functions, you're going to use lower camel case for those. Uh, so some examples like this, similar type of thing, except the very first letter is lowercase as well. Um, for any type of names you pick, use full words. Don't use abbreviations. You know, I don't want to see something like CTX for context. Say context. Make it obvious what you're talking about. There are a few standard acronyms that are okay, like you know URL. That's perfectly fine. If you have any questions on what's okay for a standard acronym, just let me know. Usually it's kind of obvious. URL is one of those ones that's like no one is going to type out Uniform Resource Locator, if, assuming that that's what it meant. I think that was right. Um, for a few exceptions to these rules, if you're dealing with a loop, IJK, perfectly fine. That's really standard. Don't worry about it. If there's a current number running through a loop, like you know n, and you're going to do n plus plus, n is fine. Um, and then also in catch blocks, feel free to use e. If there's multiple catch blocks, um, in Kotlin you should be able to use e for all of them. You don't have to say e e two. If you have nested uh, catch block, then you would need to have a different name for it. Well, maybe not. I haven't really thought about that in Kotlin too much. I think in, in Java, you had to have in a nested block a different name. Um, but uh, yeah, E is fine. You probably won't have much in the way of, of catch blocks anyway. It'll probably just be one level at very most. Um, for your project names, HW1, HW2, HW3, and so on. Um, so that's the project you're going to be creating in Android Studio. The zip file, once you're actually done and you're collecting all your code in that project directory, you're going to name it your last name, dot first name, dot hw1, hw2, and so on, all lowercase. The application ID, and this is what makes applications on the Play Store unique from each other, is going to be exactly the same, last name, first name, hw1. 
um, all of your packages inside of your application. And this is how you're going to organize your code. Packages in Kotlin work the same way that they do in Java. Uh, there are a couple things you can do in Kotlin that you can't do in Java with them, but really the structure is the same. Uh, you're going to name everything. The base package name will be last name dot first name dot hw1 hw2 and so on. Um, all of your types. So anything that you're declaring, you know, classes, interfaces, enumerations, things like that, all of those have to be inside of a package. And for Kotlin, any top level functions that you're defining also have to be in a package as well. Um, so some examples of package names, you know, Stanfield Scott HW4, Stanfield Scott HW4.model, and so on. You can have as many or as few packages as you want. You don't have to break them down. You could just have last name dot first name dot HW4. That would be perfectly fine. Whatever you want to use for your organization of your code is perfectly fine. Um, any strings that are going to be visible, any literal strings. So generally, the easiest way to think about this is labels on a form. So if you have a form on the screen where it says name and then has a box and age and has a box, things like that, name and age are going to be literals that are user facing. Um, I'm not talking about things that are used like database column names. Those things are not facing the user. The user never sees those. But anything that the user is going to see, we want to put them in a string.xml file. Uh, or, now, what this does is it allows us to very easily uh, 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 translate into other languages, for example, um, or different locales. And this, uh, it's really a great habit to get into because if you start off by explicitly putting in string, you know, string literals all over the place, things aren't going to end well. Now, some of the examples I do live, I may skip that part. I'm going to try to be consistent on it. But every once in a while, if we're going fast or if we're running out of time, I may elide that part of it. Um, so the, this for your assignments, this means all of the strings that the user can see. Now for discussion participation, I love it when people people are, are actively discussing things. It doesn't happen too often, but I love it. Always remember, if you have a question, chances are somebody else has the exact same question. Um, it, you know, I, it's very, 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 very rare that I've heard a stupid question. Usually it's it's something completely out of the realm of the class, like, you know, why is the sky purple? You know, something like that. Maybe that's a stupid question. But you know, any anything about the content that helps you understand it, not a stupid question. So feel free to ask questions. Whoops, I went back there. Um, what I'd like you to do as far as asking questions outside of the class is first of all use the discussion forums. So there's there's forums for general questions. There's forums for the uh, um, assignments, things like that. There's forums for ideas you might have or thoughts on the class. Uh, you know, please use those first. Um, if it's something private, so related to your grade or related to you know you're going to be out of the class or something, you know, email me at scott.stanchfield at jhu.edu. One thing I ask here though, last term for some reason I had a a lot of problems with Outlook. There was a lot of student emails I just wasn't getting. Uh, some of it was because some students had actually attached zip files and the Outlook server doesn't strip the zip file, it just quarantines the email. Um, wonderful, isn't it? Uh, so there was some that I wasn't getting. So what I ask is if you send something and you don't hear back from me within 24 hours, send an email to scott at javadude.com or call me if you need to. Um, just to let me know you emailed, and I'll check to make sure that I didn't miss it. Don't send any type of actual content in to Scott at Java Dude. Just say, hey, I sent you an email. Did you get it? Um, the reason for that is the FERPA rules want us to use, a, a, make sure we have a secured server that the university is controlling. So that's why we're using the Outlook server and the jhu.edu email addresses. So any type of content related to your participation in the course, make sure it goes to jhu.edu. Um, so for um, the feedback, you know, at any point, you know, you know, make some comments, suggest alternatives, ask questions, give me course feedback. Uh, you know, I welcome it. I really enjoy it. Office hours. Um, now the uh, I'm supposed to have one hour every week on office hours. Most of the time, nobody shows up. 
Uh, it's like, and so it's like, you know, I sit there like, mm -hmm, fun stuff. Um, and some of that's been because of time zone issues or people having to work late. So what I wanted to try this term, um, another option that they give us is to have the students schedule office hours with me. So if there's something you need to talk about, uh, you know, and it's something that, you know, you can't answer easily in a question, in, in an email, uh, you know, or a forum, um, you know, feel free to send me an email saying, hey, you know, can we set up an office hours and we'll find a time and, you know, we'll, you know, set it for 10 minutes, half an hour, you know, whatever. Uh, and, you know, I can meet with you one on one that way for uh, if you'd like to um, zoom, download the software from zoom.us. I don't know why I have this on the slide because you obviously are here. I guess if you're watching the video, then maybe you need that. But, you know, otherwise you're here. So that is it for the logistics part of thing. Any questions? That's usually the easy part and kind of the boring part, right? Um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do at this point, I'm going to kill my camera. So bye. Uh, where is that? Stop. Now, is this stop video for me or is it stop? That's not the recording. Okay, good. So I'm going to stop that video. And... Let's talk about stuff. I'm going to move my camera out of the way. There we go. So um, what we're going to do today is let me take you to AndroidByExample.com. This, again, is the course site for uh, uh, for the, the, the online versions of the course. But there's a few things in here I'm going to have you take a look at. One of them is this Kotlin primer in week one. So Take a look at that, you know, after the class, there's a video here. The video is about an hour and it'll get you up to speed on a lot of the basics in Kotlin pretty quickly. And, you know, talk about some of the differences with Java. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, I talked about all that stuff. Um, again, you can look at the introduction information for more details. Please, 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 please make sure you read the syllabus on the Canvas course site. Um, let me go ahead and bring that up real quick here while I'm thinking of it. To do, to do, to do, to do, and we'll go into there. Um, so on the Canvas site, we have the course syllabus here. Please read the course syllabus. Um, this section here has a tells you which software versions I want you to use during this term. Um, so we're going to be using Android Studio Jellyfish Patch 1, unless Patch 2 is out tonight. We'll see how that goes. Sometimes that happens when I'm teaching. The night of the class, they release a new version. Um, please do not update it unless I ask you to, because sometimes there is an issue with it or sometimes things behave differently. And I want to make sure that when I look at your code, I'm seeing what you saw. Um, we're going to install that via the JetBrains toolbox. I'm going to walk you through setting that up in a little bit. Once we create projects, we're going to take a look and update some versions inside the projects. And so I'm listing all the versions here that we need to upgrade for different libraries and uh, um, uh, tools that we're using. Here's my contact information. Again, I have a little information about the, you know, having email uh, issues with Outlook. Send me that email in with, if you don't hear within 24 hours. Um, the Zoom information here. Here's the sample code repository for this term. So this repository, if we go there, right now doesn't have anything in it. Each week I'm going to be adding content inside that directory as well as uh, adding a link to the video for that week. And let's go back from there. Um, the online class content, here's the links to the Android by example, as well as the sample code that goes with it. Okay, so any questions at this point? So Kotlin Primer, I'm leaving that as homework if you're not familiar with Kotlin. If you're already familiar with Kotlin, you don't need to look at it. You can look at it again for review if you'd like. Um, let's talk about Android architecture. So I'm just going to use this uh, Android by example section here. Uh, I don't have any slides set up for it. I don't want to whip up any diagrams. This has got some nice diagrams in it that I want to keep. You can also read through this to get more information if you'd like as well. Um, the big thing that I want to talk about here are layers in your application and how that works from an architectural point of view. Um, what I'm going to be talking about architectural wise is pretty similar to the uh, Android MAD 
architecture. So that's modern Android development. Um, there's a couple little slight tweaks here and there that I like, um, but it's it's generally the, the MAD architecture. Um, the big thing I want to talk about here is the idea of modules and layers. So a module is a separate compilation unit. So it's a set of source code that's and resources that are all compiled and packaged together. A layer gives a set of responsibility to one or more modules. So you might have one module that acts as your entire data layer. You might have 10 modules that act as your data layer. The idea of the data layer is that it's giving you a responsibility for those sets of modules. And then you can think of those architecturally for the organization of your application. Um, in general, you're going to have something that kind of looks like this little diagram over on the side where it says application layers. Um, so we have a user interface layer, a domain layer, and a data layer. Those are the, the three basic ideas there. Um, this is very similar to MAD architecture. It may sound kind of similar to clean architecture, but clean architecture has a slightly different uh, way that they uh, set up the dependencies. Um, they say that the data layer is kind of in the middle, and then these two other layers are looking at the data layer. And the two other layers pass things based on what's in the data layer. So it's slightly different. Um, keep in mind that different architectures don't own words. You know, a lot of the discussion that I've seen is, is people saying, oh, but, you know, a domain layer means that it's uh, clean architecture. Let me show you something. So a long, long time ago, I wrote, this is, this is from 2001, I wrote an article called Layering Applications. And what I thought was really, really funny was that the structure that I described back in 2001, which isn't me, I didn't come up with this. This was just kind of a common theme that comes up once in a while. Take a look at these names here, presentation layer, domain layer, and storage layer. We're basically talking data layer, domain layer, user interface layer. This same concept has been around forever and it kind of comes and goes. People try to call it different things. People put little different wrinkles on it, but it's a really similar structure. It's been around for a really, really long time. And it's a nice way to structure things in your application. Um, but I, I thought it was really funny. You know, some, you know, I was in a meeting talking about mad architecture and I said, hey, check this out and pointed this article and it got a nice laugh because it's like, yep, uh, everything old is new again. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind that, you know, I said domain layer there. Clean architecture doesn't own the concept of a domain layer. Um, so let's dive in a little bit deeper to these to see how this stuff actually works here. Um, let's go to our data layer. The basic idea of the data layer here is how you're going to access a database or files or a web service to get data and update that data. And we want to try to capture that in a set of modules. Could be one module, could be multiple modules, but this set of modules describes how to interact with those, those uh, uh, storage units. Um, Notice here, just conceptually, I'm saying, hey, the user interface layer is getting stuff from the data layer. This doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing in between. Um, I'm just saying that the user interface uh, or domain layer are the consumers of this information. So generally, the way that I like to structure this is to have some data source classes or some you know data source objects that will do the actual work of getting the data from a database or a file or web service, and then set them up in some objects that can be grabbed from a repository object. Now the repository object, his responsibility here is to pull data from wherever it's gonna be. Maybe he's caching some data. That's one of the things that's really nice about a repository is we can pull data in and cache it somewhere. And it might not really matter where the data came from, you could use their same cache over and over again. So that way when a request comes in, the repository could grab the data from the cache and return it. Or if he doesn't have it in the cache, go and find it. Or if the cache is expired or invalidated for whatever reason, he can go and get the data and then recache it. What I like to see happen here with this repository, and we're gonna, we're gonna use him as a different module. So we're gonna have a data module to do the actual data access, a repository model, to pull that information in. But what I like to do is 
translate the objects from the actual data sources into what we call a data transfer object. And the idea of a data transfer object is an object that you use to transfer data around. What that lets us do is the user interface or domain layer doesn't care about the specifics of the actual data used to grab data from the database. The model that you use in your application and the model that your user interface is going to look at might have a different structure. Or it might not, it might have a similar structure, but maybe the actual objects that are in the data sources themselves have a little too much information. Uh, a good example of this, uh, if I go back to that uh, layering applications here, we'll see here that I actually had a data storage uh, module here that was talking to an EJB, Enterprise Java Beans. And if that doesn't give you the shivers, nothing will. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you're lucky. Um, but the idea here is that an EJB has some extra things in it. You know, it, the functions in it may throw certain types of exceptions, for example. And the business logic really shouldn't know nor care about the actual specifics behind the scenes. So if we're reading data from a database and maybe the data storage here throws certain types of exceptions for a database, you know, like a JDBC exception or something like that, um, we want to make sure we abstract that some way. So that's part of the idea of having that repository in there is to provide some abstraction and not let the domain layer or the presentation layer, sorry, user interface layer, know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, what we call that is a leaky abstraction. So if I took the data directly from this and returned it over and it gives some extra information such that the user interface or domain layer might know this is a database or a file or a web service. We're leaking the abstraction here. The actual details are leaking through this abstraction layer, and we don't want to do that. So having the repository use data transfer objects helps us abstract that more effectively. It may feel like you're doing things twice, and in a lot of cases you are. You know, you're defining the actual data here and then defining a DTO that is used just to transfer. But fortunately, with the way Kotlin works, it's really not that big a deal to implement. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So um, now each of these arrows represents a dependency. So the user interface layer or the domain layer depends on the repository and reads data from that repository, pushes data into that repository to update things. Repository depends on these data sources, and the data sources depend on the actual storage mechanisms. Uh, la, 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 la. Um, now, one thing that we're going to see, we're going to talk about this concept of unidirectional data flow inside of Jetpack Compose. And the basic idea here is that data is only going one way all the way down and only going one way coming back up. So when things change in the database, for example, they'll filter their way all the way back up. When something happens in the user interface, the user makes some changes, the user interacts or pushes a button or something, any type of data is going to go all the way down. So you don't have uh, any place where the user interface, for example, modifies the objects that are stored in the database. He's going to send that data down and the data source will do that database modification. Okay, so domain layer. Now this one is this one we usually consider optional. If you're a clean architecture purist, the domain layer is never optional. It's a required piece. This is one of the places where MAD architecture really diverges from clean architecture. And the thing is that the depending on the complexity of your application, the domain layer may be really super overkill. But in general, what he does for us is it allows us to define business logic on how we're interacting with the data on the backside. So if you have some common use cases that you want to reuse in different parts of your application, or you want to encapsulate what's going on when the user hits a button or the user types in a field, you can set up what they call a use case, which will take the information from the changes in that user interface layer and then apply them against the repository. And this allows you to centralize business logic. One of the most important uses of this is if you have different types of user interfaces. So if we looked at this and you know, right now we don't see anything on here that says Android, right? 
we just have a general application architecture. The user interface layer could be Compose inside Android. It could be Views inside Android. It could be Swing on a desktop. Ugh. It could be, um, uh, what's, the, what's the thing on uh, Swift on uh, iOS? It could be a web service. Think about that for a second. A web service should be super, super thin. It should just be, let me figure out what the parameters mean and then go do something with them. The domain layer, the same domain layer, could be used across any of these types of applications. The user interface could even be a command line interface. When we're talking user interface, it doesn't have to be graphical. It it's, could be something that the user is typing. And that user interface is just figuring out what the user meant and then calling the appropriate business logic. Now, if you're only ever going to have a single Android application, that's usually when the domain layer becomes a, a lot of overkill. Um, or if you have a you know if you have a super big application, the domain layer can be very useful to try to isolate your business logic so that different people can work on business logic from the people who are doing the user interface, for example. Um, but if you in general, if you have a you know reasonable sized Android application uh, and it's not going to be put on other platforms, the domain layer can be a lot of overkill. Okay, so. Let's talk about state for a minute here. Before we actually move into our user interface layer and start talking about what the user interface layer does, we need to think about what is the user interacting with? What is the user seeing? And if we think about that as data in our, in our user interface layer and uh, call that state, we can start thinking about, okay, in our data layer, we modify what the state is and then tell the user interface to update it. And the user interface just displays that state on the screen in some way. And if we thin down the logic in the user interface layer so that it's all he's concerned with is how do I display this state, it makes our life a lot simpler. And then on the flip side, if we, if we keep the logic as thin as possible to say, Hey, the user did something. You know, they dragged the mouse, they or dragged their finger, they tapped on something, um, they typed in something. If we think about those actions, and the user interface is just concerned with determining what does that mean, what are the semantics of that action, then the user interface can say, "Oh, the user did something," and that's all the user interface has to say. The handler for that do something, which happens in a, a view model or further down in your, in your business logic, uh, ends up changing the state. When the state changes, the user interface redisplays it. This is our unidirectional, uh, unidirectional flow. And it lets us be really simple. Display what the state is, figure out what the user meant, and send the, send the, the actions further down the pipe. That's it. It makes our life a lot simpler. Um, so let's see where I want to go from there. Let's take a look at what we're going to have inside that user interface layer. Um, now, there's typically two kind of big parts in here, the user interface itself and some kind of user interface model. We usually call that a view model. Uh, you can have one view model for your entire application. You could have a separate view model per screen. It, it's really kind of a, a matter of style for you, whatever makes more sense. Um, depending on the application size, I tend to go with you know a single view model for multiple screens, um, but it really depends on uh, what you think your structure is going to end up being. Um, so this is a diagram where we don't have our domain layer. If I throw the domain layer in there, we can see it more like this. So the whole idea here is that the user does something in the interface, taps, types, whatever. That sends a message to the view model saying, the user wants to update. The view model then says, well, how do I update? I'm going to use some business logic here. So it's either going to use a domain layer or it'll have some logic inside the view model to say, what do I need to change? Um, so this is where it depends on if you have your domain logic isolated in this domain layer, or if your domain logic is kind of split between the view model and the repository. I tend to think of the repository as pretty much just a, a, a for caching. And it, that's it really just gives you a, a layer to cache with. I don't like to have a lot of logic inside there. 
Um, the type of logic you might have down in your data layer is going to be much more associated with referential integrity, for example, and making sure that, you know, if, uh, you know, let's say you had a bank account that you were modeling, um, you might have a, a transfer. Um, why am I thinking that's the wrong word? I know that's the right word, but for some reason I'm thinking it's the wrong word. Um, you might have a transfer that you're doing between two accounts. That transfer logic might be in the data layer and exposed as a single transfer concept. Um, at the view model level, that is going to be more associated with um, in the user interface, how they're initiating that transfer. And if you need to, you know, maybe you need to gather some information before you can do the transfer. Um, so there's our with domain layer, without the domain layer. The structure is similar, but a little bit simpler. Okay, and composable functions we're going to talk a lot more about, but just to really, really briefly uh, describe what's going on here. Defining a user interface in Compose is declarative. You don't create the actual objects that are going to be displayed on the screen. You describe what you want the screen to do. It may seem like a subtle distinction, but the old way that we used to do user interfaces in Android was using what we called the view framework. And each thing on the screen is represented by an object called a view. And you would say, okay, create a button view, create a text field over here, create a panel. And all of these things, I'm saying panel, I've been doing swing recently and I really shouldn't. Um, each of these pieces is an object that you're defining in a tree and you're directly defining that. You're creating that user interface. With a composable function, you declare what you'd like to see on the screen. And then each of these functions, you you know put in uh, what you want the, this tree to look like. Once that's run, it emits the actual objects into the tree to display on the screen. So now why is this important? Let's think about updates. What they tried to do with Compose was set it up so that things are as automagic as possible. And the idea here is that when you run these composable functions, each function has some data coming in, calls other composable functions, eventually emitting things. Compose has some really nice smarts behind the scenes that says, oh, you know what? When you push this data in, you're creating exactly the same structure that you used last time. Because of that, I don't need to update anything on the screen. Now, if something comes in, like some different data, and that different data is going to be displayed on the screen, then Compose will say, oh, you know, this part of the tree is different than it was last time. So after I created that tree, I look at the two trees and I say little parts have changed. Let me go and just update the parts that have changed, and then only that stuff on the screen changes. So it's really nice, and I'll talk more in detail on how this works once we start talking about Compose, uh, but it's really pretty cool the way they've set this thing up, and uh, the performance is getting better and better on it. Uh, there's still a few issues here and there, but coding this is so much simpler than it was for uh, for views. For views, you'd have to create XML describing what's on the screen. You have to create code that listens to each of those pieces to say, hey, tell me when this text changes. Tell me when this button is pressed. And all of those things you'd have to work with. And then you have to go and say, okay, text field, update your text to this. Label, update your, your text to this. Recycler view, oh boy, I've got to write a lot of code to make a list of things appear on the screen. Um, it's so much easier now. And oops, I got somebody else coming in. Let me admit. There we go. Um, so uh, if you've done any type of work with views, you're really going to appreciate Compose. It's going to be a little bit, there's, there's a bit of a learning curve. Mainly the learning curve is just getting used to the concepts involved. But once you get used to it, it everybody I've talked to who's used Compose and has previously used views is like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Okay, now. Going down to uh, to talk about data objects for a little bit here. In your application, we have these DTO concept, this entity concept, this state concept. And if we take a look at how the data is flowing up from the database up to the user interface. In the database, we just have the raw data 
And this is whatever format that data is inside the database. And we can read that into our data source, and our data source can produce some kind of an object for us to work with. So maybe if you think of the data source as running squeal statements, and yes, I said squeal, SQL is pronounced squeal. Uh, the data source will run those squeal statements, or if you're using a no squeal database, it could, it could use no squeal. Uh, it'll go fetch the data using whatever that raw format is, and then you can create some objects out of that. We typically call these objects entities. The entity is basically the data from these data sources. And typically there's a pretty straight, straightforward mapping between an entity and a row in a table. Um, that's not always the case. You know, sometimes you have some that are kind of pulled together, but in general, think of an entity as a row in a table. So it, the entity itself usually has the flavor of the structure of the database or the structure of a file, or the structure of a web service, you know, wherever the data is coming from. The repository can then take that information and translate it into a data transfer object. And this is a piece of data that's been abstracted. Maybe we remove some pieces, so maybe we restrict it, maybe we combine some pieces, but it creates these objects that are gonna be used in the rest of your application. And they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna abstract away those details about a row in a database, that type of thing. So we pass that up to our view model, and the view model then defines state that is used inside our user interface. So state is how the data is prepared for use in a user interface. That state might just be a field from an, ob from an object. It could be something more complex. It could be a list of things. It could be a tree. This state is how the view model sets up the actual data for use in screens. Keep in mind that the way we present it on the on the the screen might be vastly different from how we represent something in a database, especially if the database existed before you did any of this. You know, sometimes you'll have in a database and you'll be like, okay, I'm going to use this existing data, but I have a very different approach for how I want to present it, how I want to manage it in my application. Okay, now events. We had data coming up from the database to the user interface. That's a unidirectional data flow. If we talk about events, these are things that start in the user interface and then move downward. So we can think of it as a matter of our user interface is represented by functions. Those are those composable functions I was mentioning. And the parameters to those composable functions really have two flavors to them. State coming in, so it could just be strings and lists and things like that and then events coming out. And we usually represent those events as functional data types. So the parameters that are coming in as event parameters are functions. So what the user interface does is says, the user did something. Maybe they dragged their finger across the screen. Let me interpret that as one of these events that's been passed to me. And then it just calls the function. And when it calls the function, the view model will do something with that. So maybe this event was the user typing something in the screen. The view model says, okay, that means I need to update some data. So I'm gonna ask the repository to update. The repository asks the data source to update. The data source performs whatever query is necessary. So we'll see that our flow from here, again, a unidirectional data flow, we're not like updating things in place. The data comes all the way down to the database. And then when the data in the database changes, different types of triggers that were set up will come back and send the data back up. Pretty nice. Any questions on that? That's the basic concept of a unidirectional data flow. Uh, note that we don't have anything in here that says, oh, I've got an object. Let me add observers to it. Let me add listeners to it. We're not doing any of that here. We're just calling functions. Okay, now concurrency, I'm gonna talk very, very briefly here. Um, User interfaces in pretty much any system are typically updated via a single thread. And they do that for, for simplicity and to avoid race conditions. If you ended up having multiple threads hitting your user interface, you could get some really inconsistent results. Um, so there's typically one thread handling user interface. Um, he'll do any type of drawing, but he will also handle user interaction. And this is where you have to be careful of. One of the, the examples I love to show with concurrency is if you have a button on the screen and the user hits the button, 
the um, uh, let's say they hit the button and there's a listener on the button that counts to 200 and then wants to update a view on the screen. The problem is the updating the view on the screen is something that has to happen in that user interface thread. The other half of the problem is when you push the button, that's happening on the user interface thread. So in other words, what happens is that if you try to update this screen to say to have the count show up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, you won't see anything until the button press is all completely handled because the user interface thread is busy. Um, so it's really important that you be careful of situations like that where you don't do work on the user interface thread for that reason. But also, if the user is interacting, the user is trying to tap or drag while something's being computed, you want to make sure that that computation isn't happening on the user interface thread or the user's interaction won't happen. They won't be able to do the drag. And this creates something that, uh, you know, either results in the application feeling like it's frozen or you know maybe in a case where the uh, the data updates aren't taking too long but they're taking long enough you'll end up seeing the user interface kind of stutter and they typically call that jank uh, so you know as the user is moving it might kind of hitch a few times so you might move a little bit and there's you can see kind of a little bit of a break so you have to be really careful about that and try to take advantage of multi-threading so that we can do computations on a different thread from the user interface. And we'll talk much more about this over time. Okay, we talked a little bit about UDF. This is an example of what a composable function might look like. Maybe you have a submit button where you have some text coming in and a button press coming out. So this is Kotlin code where we have a piece of state coming in that's just a string and we have an event function being passed in this function on button press has no parameters and doesn't return anything uh, I'll talk a little bit about this I think I talked about this in the, uh, um, the Kotlin primer but just as a little really brief here unit is a very special data type here that just means I'm not returning any value you shouldn't care about the value coming back um, so you can't actually say x equals on button press. There's no value being returned. Um, so this will allow you to define a function with any type of parameter types and return type. Real simple stuff. Um, it's going to feel a little weird at first if you haven't done functional programming, uh, if you haven't passed functions around. Once you've done it a few times, it starts to be like, you know, this isn't too bad. This is a little heads up, submit is known as a higher order function. Higher order functions are ones that take functions as parameters or return a function themselves, um, or both. You can actually do both as well. Um, so, you know, a higher order function is kind of a mathematical concept, but really it's something that allows you to do something, uh, change the function inside of another function. Um, in design pattern terms, we call this a template method, passing in a strategy. And the whole idea of a template method is that inside the body of this function, you're defining an algorithm. But there might be a few steps in there that you want the caller to be able to, to change. So you have most of your function here. When the button actually gets clicked, we can call this function that the caller passed in. So the caller can tweak the behavior of our function by passing in functions. It's really nice stuff. Um, and you know, if you took a look at the definition of template method in the design pattern book, you're not going to see this. But if you look, if you think about the concept of a template method, this is fulfilling the concept of a template method completely. And it's one of the things that if you have the design pattern book, or if you ever read about design patterns, don't think of design patterns as cookie cutter recipes. They can be used for that, but it's much more important to think of them as communication of intent. So when I say template method, I'm giving you a concept for how this structure works. And that'll help you understand what this function works in two words, template method, instead of me having to describe all sorts of details about, okay, yeah, you're defining this algorithm and certain parts of the algorithm, you want the outside world to be able to change and you're gonna pass that change in. You know, I don't have to go through all that. I can just say template method with a strategy function, a strategy uh, parameter. 
and it'll make sense you know, once you get used to the vocabulary of design patterns. But that's really the big benefit of design patterns is having that vocabulary and more effective communication between engineers that share that vocabulary. Okay, so bottom line with uh, unidirectional data flow, data comes in, so we have things like button text, events go out, like on button press. And if you stick to that, don't have the function make any type of changes to data outside. The only type, only way that this function can change things on the outside is to call these event functions. You don't talk to any globals. You don't change any of the state that came in. So if this was a person object, you wouldn't say person.name equals something. You call a function. That's all you do. It keeps your composable function simple and lets you change things on the outside in a safe way. The caller is managing that data. And then when the data changes on the outside, it recalls submit with that new button text or whatever text is coming in. Okay, any questions on any of that? I know there's a lot to, to absorb. We're gonna be going into a lot more details on how composable functions work. You're gonna see a lot of details on how the different layers in the application work. But I wanted to give the idea about how the overall structure looks before we start diving into the individual details. Okay, any questions? We have a thumbs up. I like to see a thumbs up. That's always useful. Thank you, Ben. Okay, so what I'd like to do right now, um, let's take a little break. It is 8.12. Let's uh, go to 8.27. We'll take a 15 minute break and uh, then we'll start talking about Android Studio. Okay, I'm resuming the uh, recording here. Um, if you don't hear me mention that I've turned Camtasia back on, please remind me so that I don't miss the second half of the class. That's only happened once or twice, but I, I don't like it when that happens because then I have to, you know, kind of re-record everything for everybody else um, or point them to docs, you know, things like that. Okay, any questions on anything we've covered before we move on? Okay, <clears throat> so the next thing we're going to do is talk about Android Studio, setting it up, and all that type of fun stuff. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to grab the JetBrains toolbox. So I'm just going to uh, type in JetBrains, pretend that it didn't actually complete their toolbox, and try to find it. And we have the JetBrains toolbox app. I'm going to go there. And... You're going to download the version for your app for your uh, OS. So I'm using Windows here for excuse me. <coughs> I'm using Windows here for example, but you can pick different uh, formats for different uh, um, you know Linux or Mac as well. So I'm going to hit download, and that's downloading for me. And that was quick, so I'm going to go ahead and run it. And it's going to install this. <clears throat> and what we end up with, uh, let's see, so we'll just use the system one, we'll use English. <clears throat> so what you'll end up with, you'll end up with a little icon on your uh, taskbar, top bar, you know, depending on what system you're in. And you can click on that uh, to open up the toolbox. So the toolbox is going to start looking like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to go down and find Android Studio. Unfortunately, these are not alphabetical, which is, there might be an option for it somewhere, but uh, it's silly that's not the default. So we're going to take Android Studio here, and I'm going to click on the little dot, 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 and say Available Versions. What we're looking for here is Jellyfish, and it's still patch one. Okay, so Jellyfish patch one is what I'd like you to use. I'd like you to go to this additional versions just to make sure you're grabbing patch one so we're all in the same version here. And then hit install. But you can install other ones as well. You could install some of the, the Canaries uh, or the uh, release candidate for Koala, for example. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and install this and install Android Studio. <clears throat> and that'll just take a moment to download. I just switched apartments and it looks like my internet's working okay. Took three days to get it set up, but uh, that's Verizon for you. When it works, it's great. We're gonna have a couple spots like this where we're gonna have to wait and I'm gonna have to fill time by 
flapping my lips uh, just as it downloads different parts of Android and things like that. Now, Android Studio is based on IntelliJ, which is JetBrains' main IDE. Uh, and so it tends to lag a little bit behind the latest features in IntelliJ because they cut a copy, work in the Android stuff, test it out, release it, you know, put in new features, things like that. Okay, so it's unpacking. And this is something that when I used to teach this class, I didn't use JetBrains Toolbox. I was just downloading the zip, so I'd always have it pre-downloaded. So you know, there was a minute that I didn't have to kill. So we'll go back to Tools, and now at the top, you'll see Installed Android Studio. So I'm going to click on Android Studio there to open it up. And it's going to ask you first if you want to continue from a previous configuration. So if you were upgrading Android Studio and you already had an installation, you could use this first option. Now, I cleared everything out, so I'm starting from scratch here. Uh, so I'm going to say do not import settings. <coughs> and I can't drag that window. So you're, this just is basically saying, do you want to help improve Android Studio? I'm going to say send user statistics to Google. Totally up to you if you want to do that or not. Um, I work for Google, so I like to, to tell them things. Um, okay, so here is our initial Android Studio setup wizard. I'm going to hit next. You have two options, standard install or custom install. Um, I like to choose custom install just so I can make sure I choose which uh, user interface look I have. And I also get a view for where the things are being installed. So I'm going to hit custom. And inside here, it says that the Android SDK is going to go underneath my app data local on Windows. Uh, I'm going to install the SDK. It's going to install the, the platform version 14. So that's update down cake. Uh, and then some performance stuff um, and a virtual device there. So I'm going to hit next. This is now asking for Haxam, and I don't think this is needed anymore. I'm not sure why it's coming up. I'm going to go ahead and walk and go through it, um, but I'm going to have to take a look because I believe it depend well depending on what platform you're on. I don't think you really need this anymore, um, but I'm going to keep it at the four gigabyte recommended, and hit next, and it'll execute the hypervisor driver. Blah 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 blah. Hit next telling me everything's going to go on, hit next. And now we have to accept licenses. You only have to do this once, uh, and then it just remembers your, your preferences unless things have changed. So I'm going to say, pick the SDK license, and I'm going to change that to accept, and then the Intel license, accept, and hit finish. And so now it's actually downloading the Android SDK and an image that it's going to be using when we run our emulators. Uh, now, depending on what your system is set up like, um, my system has like a billion gigabytes of RAM. I, I don't know, maybe it's 64. 64 and a billion, they're the same. Um, if you have a lot of memory, then emulators really are no big deal. If you're a little more limited on memory, you know, especially if we're talking 16 gig or lower, um, that's going to be really tight for running Android Studio and running an emulator. Um, if you have an Android phone, your best bet is going to be to plug that phone in using a cable instead of using an emulator. And that way you're not going to, you know, Android Studio by itself is a bit of a pig memory wise, um, but running it with an emulator, that can be really painful. Um, now, I don't like to require a phone for this class. Oops, I had to hit the user account control OK button a couple times here. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Um, where was I? Uh, oh, so I don't like to require having a phone for this class. Um, I recommend it because I think it's more fun to develop and actually see what you're developing up here on a phone. Um, but you don't have to have one for the class. Um, so ideally, if you have enough memory, emulator is going to be just fine to do it without a phone. If you um, if you don't have enough memory, then uh, you know, I would recommend seeing if you can find a cheap phone. And there's a lot of like prepay phones that you can find for, I don't know, like 40 bucks. Um, I used to have a little collection of them that I had gotten from Target for like 60 bucks each, and I'd lend them out. Um, but that was so long ago that, you know, they're complete, completely worthless at this point. Okay, so I'm going to hit finish. 
And if anybody has any trouble as far as uh, memory or um, having a phone, um, let me know. We can talk about it. And uh, but because I don't require a book for the class, um, the you know they told me that I could require a phone. Um, but uh, it, again, I don't like to require it. Um, I just like to recommend it. Okay, so here we are at the welcome screen for Android Studio. And from here, we can do some customization, we can create new projects, all sorts of fun things like that. Um, what I'm gonna do to start with, well, I'll go ahead and create a project first. I was gonna go ahead and change some settings, um, but we'll change the settings once we're in there. So I'm gonna say new project. And we're gonna start with this empty activity. Now this little symbol in the middle is the logo for Jetpack Compose. And uh, that uh, that just tells you that this particular wizard is going to create a Jetpack Compose wizard. Notice these other ones say basic views, navigation drawer views, empty views, bottom navigation views, key being that word view. Don't get distracted by these guys because they look all nice and shiny. Um, there's like, oh, I can create responsive views or bottom navigation. Those are going to put you in the views framework. You don't want to use those. You're going to want to use the empty activity with the Compose symbol on it. So now here's where we're going to say for our application name HW1 or HW2 or HW3. And then change your package name to whoops, stanchfield.scott. Use your last name and first name, obviously. Um, and then pick where you want to save it. Now, by default, it's going to put it in this directory called Android Studio Projects. I'm going to put that into a directory that I just created for git and so inside here android summer 2024 that's going to be my base directory um, if you change the directory notice that it's actually going to try to have this whole directory be for your hw1 if you change the directory after you type the project name make sure you retype the the folder name for the project <coughs> now here we can choose the minimum SDK being used, SDK being Software Development Kit. Um, I'm gonna hit the Help Me Choose button just to show you this little guy. This screen, for some reason, they used to have it on Android Studio, but they don't anymore. And I keep poking people to say, can we add this back? Because it'd be really nice. Um, this lets you know the cumulative distribution of devices that will be able to run your application. So here, if I say my minimum SDK is, is uh, version 29, I'll run on about 81.2% of devices that have been in communication with the Google Play Store. Um, if a device isn't connecting to the Google Play Store, so if it's connecting to the Amazon Store or some other store instead, the, their statistics don't get counted. Um, one place where this really hit me was when I was doing government work, where the applications aren't being delivered from the store. So, uh, you know, we had to count on uh, the government to tell us which devices they had, and they were usually really, really far behind. Um, what we're going to do in here is we're going to pick NuGet version 24 as our minimum API. So what that means is that our application should run on 97.4% of devices, so on version 24, you know, back to version 24, all the way up to whatever our current version is. Um, and we probably don't even need to go back that far, but, uh, you know, it really kind of depends on what type of app you're writing and what you want your audience to be. When your app is on the Play Store, it won't appear to anybody who's below that minimum API level. Okay, so we're going to say 24 there, and that we got from our Canvas site right here, min SDK is 24. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to be using Kotlin as the language for our build scripts. Now you have two choices here, Kotlin or Groovy. Groovy is the, the original language they used for the Gradle build scripts. Uh, and in some ways it's similar to Kotlin, um, but it's a dynamic language. And so it's interpreted as opposed to compiled. So with Kotlin, you get a lot more static compilation support there. So I'm going to keep it saying Kotlin and hit finish. And let me move this. Whoops. Um, this is a little pop-up, and I just uh, blew it up, unfortunately. This is a little pop-up telling you, hey, here's a bunch of stuff that was just added. Do you want to add those to Git? Because uh, apparently I had the version control thing 
turned on, I strongly recommend you save your stuff in Git or some other type of version control so that any time you find yourself going, yes, commit it. Uh, otherwise, what's going to end up happening is you're going to be, yes, and then 10 minutes later, you're going to be like, oh, shoot, it's not working. What did I do? If you, if you commit at your yes points, uh, you'll be able to go back, which is really nice. I'm just going to go ahead and say add on all these, and then let me bring him over there. There we go. So here is Android Studio. Now, there's a fairly new feature called Gemini in Android Studio. That's our AI Assist, and uh, that's, you know, that the the uh, version one is out on that. Um, it's uh, it, it can give you some interesting code assist support. You can ask questions. Keep in mind you know, with any of these AI features, um, there is the chance that it's going to hallucinate. Uh, sometimes it's going to give you uh, information that is either wrong or information that it just doesn't understand. Oh, it's asking me to add more to Git. Um, so just keep in mind that what it tells you may or may not be right. Um, and that's going to happen with any kind of AI tool. You know, a lot of it is uh, there's just so much data out there. Feeding the data in and, you know, being able to tell it what's the right data is really tricky. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's it's something that's evolving. I figure in a couple of years, things are probably going to be in pretty good shape. Okay, so I'm going to close the assistant window there. Notice that it's telling us down here Kotlin version 122 is available. 1922 is available. Um, the version that I believe this sets it up is with to start with is uh, 190. We're going to want to update that. And uh, once again, right here, uh, we're saying that Kotlin 1924. That's interesting. I wonder why it says 1922 is the latest available. Because 1924 is out. And we're going to be using that. So ignore this little message. Um, now over here, this window, this little tool window, is the project view. And it's set to the Android view of the project view. I prefer to have it be the project view of the project view. So I'm going to come up here, click on Android, go to project. The difference here is this tries to organize data from the point of view of an Android application. And there's a few pieces that it doesn't display, and a few pieces I just don't like the way it displays it. By going to project, it just displays the file layout, and I just find that a lot easier to work with. Now, your mileage may vary. If you try the Android view and you like it, feel free to use it. Um, this over here, obviously, is our editor, and it's showing us our main activity. It's not showing any build files, and I want to start with the build files just to kind of show how these pieces work together. Um, the first thing I want to take a look at is this guy down here called settings.gradle.kts. Now, what this guy does is this guy, the, the stuff that's in here right now, is telling us where to look for any type of plugins that we're going to download or third-party libraries that we're going to download. So this first plugin management section is going to be looking at the Google repository, the Maven Central repository, and the Gradle plugin portal. And there's this nice little um, content inclusion set here that's just limiting what it's going to look at Google for. Anything else is going to drop through to Maven Central. If not found there, it's going to go down to Gradle plugin portal. So that's where it's going to find plugins. These are features that uh, add functionality to your build uh, so that you don't have to write a whole bunch of code in your build. Now, this section here, dependency resolution management, is for third party libraries. Where do I find those third party libraries online? So I'm going to look at the Google repository and the Maven Central repository for that. Maven Central is the main repository that's holding all our dependencies. Gradle uses the Maven dependency structure, which is really nice because it's been built up pretty well. I hated Maven. I hated Maven with a passion. I, I, at the time, I really still wanted to use Ant. Maven, if your project is super simple, Maven's great. If you have to do any configuration, it's a real headache. Um, Gradle's a little better about that, but it can still you can still get a headache ter territory pretty quick. Now down here, this is just defining for the build what is our project name. And then we're saying which sub-modules we want to build. Now this sub-module, colon app, means at the root of my project, look for the app directory. So we'll see over here, we have the app directory. And you're going to see this little icon, this little green box on him, which is just indicating that Android Studio knows that that's a module. So that's what our settings is for. Now there is a local.properties 
This guy is uh, some settings that you can define that you don't check into your version control. Uh, you're going to put information in here that's completely local information. We're going to use it later on to define our map key when we're using Google Maps. Um, but this would not go into your version control system. Um, then we have a couple scripts here, Gradle W and Gradle W.bat. This is called the Gradle Wrapper. And the Gradle Wrapper is a, a little thing that says, if I have the Gradle system downloaded, use it. If I don't have it downloaded, download it, and then use it. And so it's just a little easier than manually setting up Gradle and typing Gradle. You just type Gradle W for everything, and it just checks, do I have Gradle? If not, use it. Uh, Gradle properties are things that are basically configuring the daemons that Gradle's going to be using. So for example here, um, this is setting up the JVM, the, the Java Virtual Machine arguments that are used when different Gradle daemons are actually being set up. Um, there's other properties like use Android X, which is for the Android Gradle plugin. He's going to read that information to say, should I allow Android X to be used, or should I use this other, the older support libraries? Um, I'm going to say 99 point about a billion nines. This would be true. Um, and then uh, some other information in there. Uh, Non-transitive R class is, um, I don't think I really want to get into that, but basically each module and each dependency can have a resource class that defines the resources in it. And by resources, I mean things like images and layout files, string files, things like that. Um, and there's a couple different ways we can manage that. We can merge them all into a single class, or we can keep them independent. And this is just keeping them independent when you say non-transitive R class is true. Build.gradle.kts at the root of your project, we'll take a look at him, doesn't have a whole lot in it. And what we're doing here is we're defining which plugins we use at a common level here so that we're going to use the same version across all submodules. Now this is a little bit moot because we're using a version catalog. These specifications here are variables that the version catalog defines, and I'm going to show you that next. Um, the key thing to look in here is if you specify these, make sure you say apply false. And what that means is that I'm going to load this onto my class path, but I'm not actually going to use it as part of this build script. Uh, and so the, basically all this does for me is load up a specific version on the class path. And then in each module, like app, we don't specify the version. We're just going to use the one that happens to be on the class path. And we'll see that in a minute there. Um, what we can do is, because we're using version catalog, we could actually completely empty this out. And that would work exactly the same. If we weren't using a version catalog and we actually had the name of a library here with a version specified, this would be a good way to do it because then we can specify a common version in this top level file. Um, but this is something that I've been talking with some people about uh, possibly removing this. I don't know if we're going to get around to that, but uh, we've been talking about uh, how to set up this build with version catalogs that this really isn't necessary having anything in this file. So now underneath the Gradle directory, yeah, I was just thinking it's kind of cool to be working with the people who define these things. I have input. It's neat. Um, underneath the Gradle directory, we have this libs.versions.toml file. Toml is a type of format for um, specifying structured data. Uh, it's you know kind of similar to a JSON type format, um, except it you know isn't using the JSON format. So let's take a look at him. So we'll see that he has these different little sections. If you're used to any files on Windows, it might look a little similar to any files. Um, it's a little bit different, but uh, you know, it, it's um, something that uh, uh, lets us specify versions pretty simply. Now inside here, there's three sections, versions, libraries, and plugins. And the versions section just sets up some variables that we can reference inside our actual library definitions. So it's it's a nice place to just have some common setup for multiple libraries that use the same version. Uh, um, or just have a sing, you know a nice little top of the file place to actually set the versions of things. This is what we're going to want to fix up with these variables here. So I'm going to pull this over to the side just so I can see it. And there we go. So I'm going to update some of these. So AGP841 is the right one. That's the one we want to use. 
Uh, Kotlin, we're changing to 1.9.24. Core KTX, notice the squiggle on there. I'm just going to hit Alt Enter, and it gives me the option to say, here's the latest version. And this happens to be the one we're going to use. Now, just make sure that if you do this, double check that that's the version specified in, on the main page in our Canvas site. And I'm going to look down here on this guy, 281, and that is lifecycle runtime KTX. Oh, so this is one that actually got updated since I changed the uh, course site. In the course site, I have it say 280. Um, I'm going to fix that in the course site right now while I'm thinking of it to 281. We'll just use the latest on that. Um, okay, so then activity compose 190, that's the right one. And then compose bomb, this is the bill of materials. What a bill of materials is, is it's a artifact that has a whole bunch of, art of these artifacts listed with their versions. So you'll see here that um, we have the Compose Bomb being brought in with that Compose Bomb version. And then each of these guys down here, you'll notice, doesn't have a version specified. That's because each of these artifacts is set up in this Compose Bomb with a specific version. So think of a bill of materials as, here's a set of libraries that I want to use together. And it has all the versions in there. Could be different versions. And so this is just a convenient way to pull into your build. I want to use all these pieces of Compose and then you just mention the names of these guys without having to worry about the versions. Okay, so I've got that all updated up there. And Compose Bomb looks good. That's all good. Okay, so this gives us libraries that we're going to use uh, as third-party libraries. We're going to compile against them. We're going to include them inside of our application. These are for plugins that are being used as part of the build. So the Android plugin, this is for building Android applications. And then the JetBrains Kotlin Android is for using Kotlin to build Android applications. Now, after I made those changes, you'll notice that this little banner at the top changed to say Gradle files have changed since last project sync. And it gives us a little sync now option. So we're going to want to hit sync now. What that does is read in the data from these files so that Android Studio understands what versions of things are being used, which is great for things like code completion. You know, you'll be in the middle of you know, typing in some code. It'll pop up suggestions of the appropriate APIs based on the versions that are inside here. Um, so it's just re-indexing all the stuff that it downloaded. And there we go. Good shape. So that is our libs.versions. Now, the other thing to look at in here, we're not going to make any change in it, but if we expand Gradle wrapper, there's a jar. This is the actual code that does that download for us. And then there's this Gradle wrapper.properties. The Gradle wrapper.properties tells us which version of Gradle will be downloaded if somebody uses Gradle W. Um, you don't need to update this too often. Sometimes when you upgrade the Android Gradle plugin, it's going to require a newer version of Gradle. So if you're doing those updates, you might need to do that. The upgrade wizard that'll pop up when you do need to do one of those usually will take care of this for you. Okay, so that's all at the top level here. These, this is just a cached copy of the Gradle that got downloaded. This is a bunch of metadata for the IDE itself. And then app, that module, is really the interesting piece here. So let's expand this. Now, when you're doing your homework, all I want you to do is do those changes to the versions and then run the application just to make sure it works. Once you have that, you can turn it in and you're done. That's all you need to do for the homework. Um, so let me close all those. We're going to go inside this app module. And at the top level, we're again going to see a build.gradle at KTS. Now, this ProGuard rules, just by the way, this is a set of rules for minifying your application, meaning it's going to remove different uh, um, functions that it thinks aren't used, variables it's not used, um, as well as obfuscating it. So uh, if you wanted to have your application basically kind of shuffle the names so that if somebody tried to decompile, it would, they either wouldn't be able to decompile or it'd be really difficult to read when they did re decompile. We're not going to be doing anything with that in this class. Um, but the build.gradle.kts at this level is the module level build file. And this is the interesting one. Let's take a look at him. And you'll see that he's got a little bit of stuff in him. Um, 
notice that these dependencies, I'll start down here, each of these guys are references to things in the version catalog. So if I look at that version catalog again, notice in libraries I have Android X core.ktx. This is going to create a variable called libs.androidx.core.ktx. So if I go over here, libs.androidx.core.ktx, boom. And that will work with Code Assist. So if I hit um, Control Space after a dot here, it's showing me the next levels in this. You see here's Core. Uh, so if you wanted to use Content Assist to add new things in here, you could. This guy is bringing in that bomb I talked about, which will end up resolving these guys' versions. Um, it's not because of the order, it's just because those are the things that are listed inside the bomb. So there's several different configurations listed here. There's a configuration called implementation. This means libraries that my app module needs for compilation and for runtime. If instead I said API, I get that functionality, but I also expose whatever that library is as part of the API of the module I'm defining. So if you're defining a library and you wanted that library to expose somebody else's functionality, you could put API in there. The problem though is that if you say API, it's gonna force a lot more rebuilding. Most of the time you wanna say implementation, only use API if you really, 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 really have to. Test implementation is used for JUnit tests. This is gonna be, in this case, the only one that we're pulling in is the JUnit library itself. Android test implementation are for a, a runtime instrumented tests, and these actually run on an emulator. And so these guys here are going to, it's gonna start up your application in an emulator, run tests against it, and then shut it down. And then debug implementation, these are extra libraries that are only pulled up if you're running in debug mode. And uh, you know, usually those are things like helping you to uh, either do some, some profiling or to pull up um, database implementations, things like that. Uh, or like this one here, I believe, looks at you can actually query the manifest file itself to see what's defined in your application. Now we'll go up back to the top here. Here's a plugins block. It's very similar to what we saw before, but notice it doesn't say apply faults. This is saying I want to use the Android application plugin and the JetBrains Kotlin Android app, uh, plugin. So it's whatever versions happen to have been loaded earlier. But again, since these are defined in the version catalog, that's already taken care of. So we don't we didn't really need to pull those from the main one. This guy here is a configuration object for the Android application plugin. So this plugin defines what we call an extension, and that's a special object that right here we're defining, I'm gonna set some fields in that object or call some functions in that object. So I'm setting the namespace field, setting the compile SDK field, looking at the default config object inside of him, setting a bunch of fields and so on. Um, so the, the key things in here I want you to look at are first of all namespace. This is going to give you uh, basically a package that defines where the R class is defined. So the R class I'll talk about in just a minute, it defines all the resources in your file. Compile SDK is which version of Android you're gonna compile against. So what functions you have available when you're doing your compilation. Uh, min SDK is the minimum one you're gonna work on and that was NuGet that I pointed out. Target SDK is the one that you're saying you've tested against and it defines how your application is gonna behave in the platform. And what I mean by that is, let's suppose for example, um, you were testing your application on, on SDK 30. And on 30, maybe one of the behaviors it did was displaying a round border around an icon. In 34, maybe they changed it to square, display a square border as the default for icons on the home screen, for example. Um, if you say target SDK 34, you're gonna see a square border. If you said target SDK 30, you'd see the round border. But think of this mostly as which version of Android you're saying that you've tested your application against. Okay, um, version code and version name, these are the things that trigger if updates are needed on the Google Play Store, well, the version code is. So if the version code increases, then users will be notified that the application has an update. 
the version name is just a readable name that you display in your application. And there's some strategies that people have for keeping these in sync. You know, maybe for like if your version was 1.0.0, maybe your version code is 1.0.0.0, something like that. Um, and then you know you can you'll you'll make sure that if you update it to two, you just change that to a two there. So that's one approach some people use. There's a bunch of other approaches people use to to try to keep those relatively in sync. <coughs> Um, this tells you which class is going to actually execute those instrumented tests, the ones that run on the emulator. This is some special support here saying if I'm running on an older version of Android, so, and I can't remember if 24 is old enough for this. I'm trying to remember when vector drawables were introduced. That might have been 21... So we might actually not need this. But the whole idea here is that um, if the vector drawable native support isn't available, meaning that you define something to draw on the screen using um, SVG type format, the scalable vector graphics, um, if that's not directly supported, what it'll do is this use support library says, if I know it's not, uh, if, if, and if uh, the Android Gradle plugin knows that vector drawables aren't available on the earlier version, it's actually going to draw these things during part of the build and store them as images. Um, so not great, but it's it's a nice stopgap if you don't have true vector support on whatever your minimum version is. And I think as of 24, I think it, that might be even 18. It's been a long time since we've supported uh, vector drawables. Um, so anyway, that's that basically is, is is your main setup for the application with all those guys. Application ID I didn't mention. This is your unique identifier in the Google Play Store. Only one application can have that identifier. Once you have added this identifier to your account, nobody else can create an application with that name. So that makes sure that you're the only one who can update this. Um, build types lets you configure different types of uh, application builds. So by default, there's debug and release are the two main ones. Anytime you run something in Android Studio, it's gonna be a debug build. The release build is what gets generated so you can actually put it on the Play Store. And so sometimes there's some things you wanna change in there, like you might wanna minify your application, remove code that's not being used, so you could change that defaults, um, and then set the rules in this file here. Uh, there might be some other things that you change in there. Um, but then there's also things you can define called variants in your application. So maybe you have a free variant versus a pay variant. Um, and you can combine those. You could have a release free, release pay, debug free, debug pay, and so on. Ends up creating kind of a cross product of the different options. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, compile options. This is mainly for, whoops, <laughs> this is mainly for Java support. So um, which version of the Java language do you want to be allowed in the application? And which bytecode do you want to generate? Um, and uh, depending on what you're trying to do, most of the time you're going to keep these at, at 1.8, but you could bump them up to 17. Uh, I think 21 is what we're working on right now. Um, what's going to happen behind the scenes? The Android platform has definitions of a lot of the Java runtime libraries. And um, sometimes there's newer features being added that aren't in the Android platform itself. So what this does is if we're using features from a newer version of Android, it will do, um, ah, shoot, what's the name of it? Uh, Desugaring is what it calls it. It'll take the newer functions and convert the code into what it will work on the older platforms. Uh, and so there's a limited number of things available. If you take a look at desugaring on developer.android.com, hey, you know, there's an idea. Let me tell you where the doc site is. How about that? So d.android.com. That takes you to developer.android.com, which is our developer site for Android. And if you're on there, and you go to slash build slash JDKs. This is the page I wrote. Woo, yay. Uh, I feel so proud. I actually have a, a page on the main developer site. Um, hopefully I'll have more there. There's I'm working on some version stuff for builds that uh, will go here as well. Um, but 
this is the main developer site and on there if you do a search for D sugar you'll see how this works so like Java Java 8, 8 APIs it tells you which APIs you can use from Java 8 that will actually work on the Android platform Okay, now KVM options, this is saying, or uh, the, the JVM target for Kotlin options says which bytecode is being generated when Kotlin runs, because Kotlin runs on the Java virtual machine. Um, and a little, little note here, on Android itself, we don't directly use a Java virtual machine. We use something called uh, the, the um, Android runtime, or ART, which is uh, our own implementation of a machine to run this code. Uh, and the Java bytecodes, which are in the class files, get translated into something called Dalvik bytecodes. Okay, uh, build features. This is saying what types of things we should look for to uh, for the Android Gradle plugin. So the Android Gradle plugin will say, ooh, compose equals true. I'm going to look inside all of the source files and see if anything says at sign composable. If so, I need to run the Compose compiler plugin that runs inside of the Kotlin plugin itself, um, or some other things that it does as well. Um, this tells us which version of that compiler plugin to use. Now, not too long, this isn't going to be too big a deal. Um, I think starting with uh, Kotlin 2.0, it's automatically taken care of. Um, but up through 1.9, we have to pick a specific version here. Um, and if we come back to canvas we'll see here that I have Kotlin compiler extension version 1.5.14 it's really important that you match these up I'm gonna say here Kotlin compose map this gives us the Kotlin to uh, the compose to Kotlin compatibility map and we'll see in here that each specific version of Kotlin uses specific versions of the Compose ver the compiler. So they have to match. So if we're using 1.9 to 24, we have to use 1.5.14. As of 2.0, should be just fine. So I need to change this to 1.5.14. Okay, um, and this is just saying uh, we're excluding the license files from uh, the meta inf, um, something like that. I'm really not sure why it why this is in here um, but it looks like it's excluding license files um, so then we have our dependencies at the bottom and everything's good now we made some modifications to this so i'm going to resync again there we go and now let's actually start looking at what makes the project run that's in the source directory now the source the directory setup is real similar to what it was set up in maven source main uh, whoops source main java blah 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 now note that this is a java directory we're going to be doing everything in kotlin but if you use that java directory you could use java or kotlin if you use just the kotlin directory you can only use kotlin so typically our advice is use java there but if you wanted to you could rename that kotlin and as long as all you're using is kotlin it'll work just fine now underneath there we have our package name and then, so this is Stanchfield Scott HW1 dot UE dot theme is for this subdirectory. And these are three files that are generated for us for Compose to set up the theme. So we have some colors, we have uh, information about the theme and uh, the um, uh, typesetting for fonts and things like that. We're not really gonna deal with, deal with these. I might as well show you them real quick. The colors here are just top level values defined in Kotlin. Notice that they're not inside a class. In Kotlin, you can have top-level definitions. Um, just as a by the way, see the name of this file here, color.kt? This creates a class called color.kt with an uppercase K. And inside that class, it defines these guys. That's just how it stores things behind the scenes for use in Java. The typesetting stuff sets up you know, here's body large, title large, label small. You can define whatever types of font settings you want here. Um, and while I'm in here, I'm just going to go ahead and, um, well, no, that's next week. Next week I talk about density independence. Um, I was just going to mention what scalable pixels are. 
um, these these sizes scale based on the user's font size setting because the user can set it from small up through large and there's like a little scale they, they slide between and so 16 20 16 and 24 are relative to each other but then the user's scaling gets applied to those the theme in here sets up different color schemes and then the overall theme here is saying which theme do i want to pick so here we're just using a when expression inside kotlin to check to see what uh what we're going to be using so in this particular case if our version sdk is greater than or equal to s we're going to pick the theme from the context otherwise we're just going to say well is the color scheme dark or not so this will all make more sense once you get used to kotlin um, so the main activity is really what we want to look at here in android an activity is essentially a screen it's a it's a top level screen you can put things in and in early versions of android what we we recommended people do was create multiple activities and you would move between different activities in the application and each activity would manage its screen uh, this made it really tricky to transfer data between screens so the the current way that we're proposing you do things is to typically have a single activity and that single activity manages the view model for you and the view model can then manage the data for whatever you want to display on that screen so when we're doing our composables we're putting stuff in that screen so if we look at this on create function android has a life cycle approach to putting things on the screen you do not say create an activity and then call functions you register that activity and let's take a look at that underneath res so res android manifest we'll see here that we are defining an application and inside that application we have an activity which is main activity. So we're registering this, we're telling the system main activity exists. And then we tell it how to invoke that main activity. So in this particular case, we're using action main category launcher. This is a special combination of action and category saying that this activity should appear on the home screen. And then when the user taps it, Android will say, oh, let's go ahead and create an instance of the main activity and then call its various lifecycle methods to do stuff. Um, if instead we had other types of things listed as an intent filter, we would then only be able to get to this activity if somebody called start activity passing in something called an intent, which is just a little object describing what they want to do. The intent filter says, I can provide that service for you. And if they say, I want to do X, and this activity said, I provide X, it'll automatically go over to this activity. And once again, Android will open up the activity, create the instance of it, walk through the lifecycle functions. So the, the main lifecycle function that we're going to use here is called onCreate. That's for setting up your user interface. Um, if you were doing view-based stuff, you'd have a whole bunch of other functions in here. You'd have a matching on destroy, you'd have a on pause, on resume, an on stop, on start, and each of them take effect at different parts of the life cycle of this object. Um, for compose development, you usually only care about on create. So in our on create, we're setting up our user interface. The first thing we're doing is enabling edge to edge mode. So it just makes things look a little nicer. The uh, the big thing you're going to see is the difference there is that the status bar at the top doesn't have a solid background. It just kind of meshes with your application. Um, and then set content is setting the user interface that you're going to see inside this screen. So this user interface is a series of calls to composable functions. So we're calling HW1 theme, which was defined over here in the theme. And that guy is defining a bunch of theme variables that are available. Things like the, the uh, typography, so you can actually ask what font sizes I want to use. The color scheme to say what colors I want to use. And then any call to a composable inside is going to be able to access that data. So he's just setting up some what we call um, local context data. Um, no, that's the wrong term. Uh, la, 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 la. A configuration local. I am blanking on the term for this. It'll it'll hit me about two o'clock in the morning, I think. Um, so your composition local. 
that's the name of the, the, the variable. So he's setting up something called a composition local, which lets you scope some data for use inside. Now, I strongly recommend you avoid defining your own composition locals. It's super tempting because then you don't have to pass as many parameters between these functions. They act kind of as a scoped variable that's available to nested things. Um, and there's certain things that are useful for us. So, you know, defining the theme, that's pretty nice. I would have preferred having some kind of an object that captures all that data explicitly passed to all these functions. Um, I really, it, it kind of feels like global data when you're inside these functions, and I'm, I'm not too keen on that. Um, but it is what it is. Um, so scaffold is setting up the general structure of your application. And with that, you can define a toolbar, you can define navigation buttons at the bottom, you can define a drawer on the side, things like that. Um, and then inside there, we're calling a function that we've defined down here called greeting. So here is a nice, simple, composable function, takes in a name coming in and a modifier, which is used so that the caller can affect the layout of this thing. That's kind of the most common thing you use the modifiers for. Um, so we pass in the name, and most uh, composables take a modifier as the last parameter. And so what he's doing is he's going to say, I'm going to use the common text component to say, hello, name, passing in that modifier. Um, we also have a little preview down here that if I run this preview, which I can go ahead and do, it might take a moment. Let's see what happens. We get this little preview section over here. And oh, I'm running the preview on the emulator. That's why it's taking so long. So it's actually loading up the emulator. And um, that's really not what I wanted to do. I don't use previews all that often. Um, but let me go ahead and, well, He's almost up. There he is. So now we're just seeing this displayed. It's not our whole application. It's just this little user interface piece. Um, now what we can also do is from this main activity, there's an option over here to split the screen and it shows you any of the previews. So you will just have a preview of that little piece displayed here. Now this is running in a different type of tool than the emulator, so it might not be perfectly accurate, but it gives you a pretty good idea of what things look like. Um, and you can have multiple of these guys. Oops, I did not set up my keyboard. I say preview two, we'll say Scott. There we go. And so we'll see that the difference there, I now have two previews. So you can set up multiple previews. So while you're working with something, you can kind of see things in different contexts with different data, maybe with different uh, uh, themes applied, things like that. So that's what those guys are for there. Okay. So now let's go ahead and actually run the application. I'm going to switch this back to the code view. There we go. Um, and let's run this application. Now you notice up here at the top, it gives you the context or the, the target you're going to run this thing in. Um, or actually the thing you're running. So it's running the greeting preview on the emulator. I'm going to change it to the app. So it's going to run the application. This shows you which device it's going to run on. You could have several emulators set up. If you had a phone plugged in, you'd see your phone listed up there as well. Um, so I'm just going to leave it as this Pixel 3a using API 34 uh, to display it. And I can say run the app. And it builds it and runs it. And there we go. So we can see that the application is running here. Edge to edge made the uh, background of that bar match the background of our application. Uh, and there we go. So now we have a uh, application running. Now we'll notice up here it says live edit disabled. Um, let's see if I can remember how to turn him on. Oh, that must be in the options. I think that that's a, a overall an option. Um, configure live edit, there we go. So we have a couple options here for live edits, which means I can change some things in my compose and have it just appear in the UE. 
And most of the time that works really, really well. Um, so I'm gonna do it on manual save. So if I hit Control S, it'll update. So if I come over here and then change this to say, um, humu humu, nuku nuku, apu, ah ah, whoops. Nuku nuku, apu, ah ah, there we go. Um, and then hit Control S to save it. We'll see that it's gonna get updated. Now he's saying out of date. Refresh the apps and device. Why was it uh, that bad? Let me try changing it again, because it should be able to let me just change that and hit Control S. There we go, that worked. I don't know why, it, maybe I accidentally um, killed a quote when I was doing that. So I change it back and hit save. There we go. And so that can give you kind of a, a fast update if you want to make little tweaks to the user interface. Doesn't work perfectly, especially if you have uh, function changes. Uh, so if you're, you're adding parameters to a function or uh, changing a name of a function, things like that, then it won't work. Um, it's kind of similar to if you ever use hot swap in, in Java. Okay, so that was running our application. So what I want you to do for your homework one is create an application modify the version numbers that are inside of the build scripts, and then run it. Boom. Once you run it, then all you need to do is zip up your project and submit it. Now, a little note on the zipping the project. One of the things I want you to also do is delete these build directories. So if you go out to your file system and let's see, whoops. Uh, where is this guy? Get... See if I can change the size of that a little bit. There we go. So if you go out to your file system uh, before you do your zip, go into your directory, and at the top level, if there's a build file, delete it. Now in this case, we don't see a build file. Um, then go into your app directory and delete the build script, the build directory there. So I'm gonna delete him. Um, that just mean that just makes us. There's a lot. Your, your zip file isn't going to be as big. Um, and so once you've done that deletion, then go ahead and zip up your homework directory and you can submit it on Canvas. Um, so that's really all you need to do for the first assignment. It's pretty straightforward. Any questions on that? I know I've given you the fire hose, but uh, you know, hopefully I was able to, you were able to follow everything I was talking about. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is uh, talk about some settings that I think are good common settings to, to do and things that I'm going to need because I'm used to Eclipse and, and Eclipse was the key mapping that I learned a while back. When we switched over to Android Studio, um, I switched over to the Eclipse key mapping in Android Studio so I just didn't have to relearn everything. Um, this way my muscle memory still works. Um, so I'm going to go to File, Settings, uh, there he is. Note that if you're on a Mac, it's not going to be off the file menu. It's going to be off the Apple menu. And it'll say, app, it, it'll be preferences underneath the Apple menu. Um, I believe on Linux, it's still file uh, settings though as well. So we'll go to file settings. And inside here, let's take a look at a few things. Um, the first thing I want to do is take a look for camel, uh, camel humps mode. So I'm going to type in camel. And I'm going to go to smart keys. And there are these two options for camel humps. And in Eclipse, there is a really great way this behaves because um, I like to use the control arrows to jump between words. Um, so camel humps words does that. So if I were at the beginning of the, the word camel and hit control and, and write, it'll jump to the word humps. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. If I'm inside here, we'll say fun sum function name and such, something like that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold the control key and watch what happens when I hit control right. Boom, it jumped to the end of that entire thing. Um, and what I like to have in Eclipse, it just jumps between words using that. Now, flipping that around, if I double click inside of this, watch what happens. It, uh, oh, interesting. It selected the whole thing. I didn't think it did that. Oh, maybe I don't need to change that other one. Um, that used to not work. It used to actually select just the word you were on. Um, so I'm going to go 
to settings again and we'll say camel to find those and it says honor camel humps words settings when selecting on double click oh that's why i had to undo it so i'm going to say use camel humps words boom that's going to set it up so that control arrow is going to go from word to word but now with this guy set up he was he's going to just select each individual word so that's the problem so i basically like to swap these two check use camel humps and uncheck honor camel humps um, i like to recommend that you could give it a try either way. Uh, I find it super useful. So when I come into here, now I can come into here and move between using those. And so I could say, you know, some function of fun. And I could just change pieces of it very easily instead of having to use my mouse to select pieces. And now again, if I control click, it selects the whole word. Okay, so far so good. Let's go back to settings. That's the first thing. Now the key map, I like to change that to an Eclipse key map. Now you can use the, the key map that's there as is. Um, I'm just not familiar with it. So I'm gonna change it here to say Eclipse. I'm gonna click on this little icon for the, the, um, the gear and say duplicate and just change it to be Eclipse SAS because I wanna make a couple changes. I'm gonna hit enter to save that. And then inside here, I need to make a couple changes. So I'm gonna look for move and scroll down until I see move line down. So move line probably would have been good too. Um, notice that there's move le element, le uh, move statement down, move statement up. That is kind of, um, what's a good word for it? Uh, twitchy uh, to, to, make, to make work right. In Eclipse, um, alt up and alt down would just move whatever lines are selected as a block. Move statement up and statement down sometimes gets in a situation where you can't move things outside of some context. So I like to change these. So I'm gonna to go to move line down and change him to be alt down and remove the other definition of him. And then move line up, change him to alt up and remove him. Now this, uh, well, let me actually do the other one as well. Um, I'm gonna say duplicate. So duplicate entire lines, control alt down is what I like to use for that. Um, in Eclipse, there was also control alt up, which would actually duplicate it above where you're at. Um, but I never used that. So I'm gonna hit okay. So let me show you what these do for us. Let's say that I have a block of code that I wanna copy from one spot to another. Um, I could of course select it and then copy and paste. Um, but something that I, that I feel is easier is if I wanted to, let's say, duplicate that copy edge to edge, I just hold Control Alt down and boom, there he is. Now, if I just hold Alt, I can now move him to wherever I want. And you're gonna see me do this quite a bit because uh, it's in my muscle memory. Uh, so if I wanna like copy a block and then make some tweaks, I'll do that quite a bit. If you wanna copy more than one line, you can highlight them both, Control Alt down, boom. And then if multiple lines are selected and you use your Alt arrow, it moves it up and down. So this this is what's happening. You're going to see me do this quite a bit. Um, if you for, if you forget about it and you're like, "Ooh, what are you doing?" That's cool. Let me know. I think this is one of the most useful keyboard things that was inside Eclipse. Um, and it's a little thing, but it it's, it really I think it saves you a bunch over um, the you know highlight, copy, paste. Um, so you will see me do that. That's why I like to demonstrate it. Okay, and back into settings. Let's see, there was a couple other things and I'm trying to remember what they are. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm gonna bump the font size up just a little bit here. So I'm gonna go to editor and font and let's go to 16. Let's go with 16. Um, okay. That's a little better. So this, this might be a little bit easier for you to see on the screen. Uh, so I like to change that. And is there anything else that I wanted to change? Color scheme, code style. So under code style, one thing that's really important here, go down to Kotlin. And underneath there, go to imports. Um, oh good, the defaults are there. So use single name import you want for both of those and don't have any package stuff at the bottom. Um, I'm not positive this is the default. 
uh, this might be picking it up from somewhere from I, me configuring it before because it used to be use import with star and star imports are incredibly evil. Uh, let me point you to I'll go to javadude.com and articles and we'll take a look at import on demand is evil and the the way that this works, it works exactly the same in Java and Kotlin. Um, and it's a completely evil uh, thing. Um, early on in Java, what people used to do is they would type in import blah, 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 dot star, import blah, 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 dot star, and just pull things in. And they, they, they thought this was the best thing ever because you didn't have to have all these independent imports. Um, the problem is that early on, people used to do this inside Java, in you know Java version one. And Java AWT was the user interface toolkit, the initial one from Java. And Java util is just some helper things like vector or something like that. Um, now initially, list only existed in Java AWT. And so when you typed in these two imports and said list in your application, boom, it found uh, Java AWT and everything was fine. Unfortunately, in Java 1.2, they added a list class to java.util. And what that means is that all this code that worked perfectly fine in Java 1.1 and Java uh, 1.0, all of that code broke because now it's ambiguous. Which list did you mean? So this is a feature that I think is just incredibly evil because you shouldn't have a, f a feature in a language where if you add a class, it breaks your code. Adding a class should be a safe operation, but because of import on demand, it's not. So don't use import on demand, otherwise known as star imports. Um, okay, so come back over to here. And let's... So we got that. Just double check that single name import is set on there. Don't use stars. Stars are evil. Uh, and I think there was something else that I wanted to tweak. Uh, la, 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 la. Where was where was live edit? Oh no, we had that working. Um, thought there was like one other tweak. No. Well, if I think about it, I'll, I'll come back to it. But for some reason, I was thinking there was one other little tweak and it's just uh, eluding me. Okay, so um, those couple tweaks are gonna make my life a lot easier for editing now. Okay, so any questions on anything? I believe that covers everything I wanted to cover today. Um, make sure if you're if you're not familiar with with Kotlin, make sure you watch the uh, the primer. Um, I know some of some of the folks in this class this term were in my Kotlin class. Yay! It's nice to see you again. Um, so you know you won't need it, um, but uh, take advantage of that Kotlin primer to get familiar with it, and ask questions along the way anytime. So as I'm typing Kotlin code. If, you, if I type something and it doesn't make sense to you, ask me to explain it, even if I explained it before. Um, you know, hearing things a few times is going to make a difference. Um, things like this, where you're seeing this set content and a curly brace, look really weird to start with, but it's actually just a nice little trick. You know, in this particular example, set content is a function, and the last parameter to that function is a lambda. So it's, it's a functional parameter. So because of that, you're allowed to do this little shortcut of not using parentheses. It's basically the same as if I did this and put parentheses around it. And that's the last parameter. Um, did I put that in the wrong spot? Huh. Oh, it's the, um, well, no content is that, that guy's null. Oh, I might have to actually, 
yeah, I had to actually explicitly specify that because of that. Or I could have said content equals null. I think that would, or content equals that. Yeah. So it's basically the equivalent of that, but it's a nice little shorthand that actually makes things look more declarative. Uh, and that's something that we want our compose code to look like. Um, I'm not going to be going into details on how you define uh, a domain specific language inside of Kotlin. That's something I do in my Kotlin class and you can do some really cool stuff with it. Um, but, um, you know, we'll go through things and, you know, as I'm typing code, if, you know, I, if either I forgot to explain something or if you're not quite sure what it is, please, please, please ask. Cause I guarantee somebody else in the room is going to have the same question. Okay. So on the canvas site, We have assignments, and assignment one is the development environment and also just calls out the Kotlin primer. Please take a look if you're not familiar with Kotlin. Um, and then has some little instructions on how to set it up. You'll submit it inside here, and then you should be in good shape. So you have one week to do that. Uh, and it is uh, Wednesday nights at by 11.59 are when all the assignments are due. Any questions on anything? Sounds like a no. So thank you all for coming. I wish you a wonderful week. Feel free to post on the discussion forums or send me an email if you have any questions. See you next week.